with me in your scriptures to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. And that can be found on page 732 in your pew Bibles. And we'll be reading verses 1 through 10. But before we do, let me give you a brief introduction to the text. Isaiah was a prophet who lived over 700 years before the coming of Christ. So he was 8th century B.C. And in his day, two rulers in particular were constantly on the minds of the people that he ministered to. The first one was Ahaz, king of Judah. And the second one was Tiglath-Pileser III, king of Assyria. Now Ahaz was a severe disappointment to Judah. He was wicked and idolatrous, and much of the evil that befell Judah was because of his wicked reign. And Tiglath-Pileser was arrogant and cruel and hungry for more land. And he struck fear in the tribes of Judah and in King Ahaz as well. Could you imagine being in a situation like that? Your hometown kid who's on the throne is a complete failure and a coward. And your enemy's king, whom you fear the most, is arrogant, cruel, and hungry for more land and bordering up on you. And it is amidst this doubly dark backdrop against these two failures of kings that incite cowardice and fear in the people of God that a promise of an ideal king to come, who's going to not just embody the strengths of these kings, but transcends their weaknesses as well. A promise of a son of David, like Ahaz, and yet who will not be wicked and unjust, but righteous and fair. And like Tiglath-Pileser, He'll be a ruler of the nations, and yet he won't arrogantly and cruelly oppress them, but rather bring healing to them. So reading from Isaiah chapter 11, going down to verse 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him, shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for the promises that you grant us in your scripture, and we pray that we would clearly see this one and latch onto it with the eyes of faith and live in light of the glorious coming of King Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Was the political race for presidency heats up, So do emotions and tensions in the citizens of our nation. And this is because even in our modern world, we still understand something of the concept of as a with a ruler, so with a people. We know that much of our fate and our future are intertwined and dictated by who the leaders of our countries are. And so we struggle to get our candidate as the one who is put in a position of power to change things in the way that we believe they should be changed. And if this is true in our modern world, it was especially true in the ancient world. A nation rose to peace and prosperity or sank to destruction and despair on the back of their king or their political ruler. And scripture itself affirms this interplay of a ruler from the very beginning. Remember, when God creates Adam, it says that he made him in his image. In the ancient world, an image was often set up, a physical image, of a ruler 
in a foreign land where he wasn't currently physically and bodily present. And so it was a witness, and some rulers still do it to this day. Where they are not physically and bodily present, they'll set up a statue of themselves to signify that their reign and rule, despite being absent, still extends to that land. And that is what Moses is saying mankind as a whole was to function as. God, who was resident in the heavens, his reign and rule was going to extend down to the earth through his image bearers, where mankind was something of God's love, his benevolence, his organization, his mastery, his wisdom would be displayed. And yet we know Adam fails in imaging God. When he is placed in the garden, rather than exercising dominion and God's reign and rule over the serpent as God commissioned him to do exercising dominion over the beasts of the field, the serpent ends up exercising dominion over him. And so mankind's reign on earth began to resemble the serpent's image more than it did God's image. Mankind began to rule with murder and with deceit like the serpent and not with justice and righteousness like God. But God did not just wholesale abandon his plan to manifest his divine rule on earth through a human agent. Rather, he re-ups the promise and he says that amidst all the serpent-like rulers on earth, there will come one who is truly human, who embodies all that Adam was supposed to embody and bring his reign in heaven down to earth. And the scriptures from the beginning trace the genealogy of this royal man, this one individual who will fulfill this promise to bring God's reign and rule in heaven down to earth. And it traces it through Abraham down to David, where God promises David that one of your sons will sit on the throne and he will be king of all the earth forever. Unfortunately, in Isaiah's day and in the days of his people that he is ministering to, that man was still 700 years in coming. Instead, they had, as we said, the pale parody of David, King Ahaz, and the terrifying ruler of Tiglath-Pileser III. And yet in the midst of that dark backdrop comes this glorious prophecy of Isaiah, of an ideal king who will fulfill all that God had intended for mankind and for particularly the son of David. And there are three marks that I want to express to you through this text of what this king will be like and what his ministry will look like. Look at verse 2. First thing, he will be a spirit-filled king with a spirit-filled ministry. Verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. In the Bible, the spirit of God plays two primary roles. It is an equipping spirit and a life-giving spirit. So think of it being an equipping spirit. Three examples. You have Bezalel and Aholiab, who are equipped by God with his spirit to build the tabernacle of the Lord. Or you think of Saul and David being equipped by the spirit of the Lord to be the rulers and the leaders in Israel that they are called to be. Or you think of the spirit equipping Samson to carry out God's wrath on the Philistines for the oppressing of his people by performing great acts of strength normally not done by mankind. So the Spirit of God is an equipping spirit, giving skill and competency for God's intended purpose through that human individual. And in the prophesied ruler's case here in Isaiah 11, the Spirit is going to rest heavily upon him. It's going to enwrap him and fill him to be the ideal king that these two kings that Israel was currently observing and seeing could not be. But the spirit is also a life-giving spirit in scripture. It creates things anew and creates uh, new possi- possibilities for the people of God. So think in Genesis 1. It was the spirit who hovered over the dark waters and impregnated the earth to bear fruit and bring life. It was the spirit that opened the matriarch's dead wombs so that they could bear a child and bring forth life into the earth. It was the spirit that hovered over Ezekiel's 
dry, va- dry bones <clears throat> in the valley of the vision, and it brings them life and flesh. So the Spirit is a life-giving Spirit, bringing new creation and new realities, thought before unimaginable for the people of God. And that is who this prophesied king will be like. He'll be spirit-saturated, both in his identity and in his ministry. And God says later in Scripture that this ideal king is Jesus of Nazareth. And it is the spirit of the Most High that overshadows Mary and creates the new creation that is Christ Jesus in her womb. At Jesus' baptism, it is pictured in all the Gospels, the spirit hovering over Jesus and resting there. And it is that which equips him to go through his bloody baptism to bring forth a new creation for the people of God. In Luke 4, Jesus quotes from this very book, the book of Isaiah, saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. It is the Spirit that equips Jesus to fulfill his commission as God's servant. And the most glorious of all, it is the powerful working of the Spirit that raises Jesus Christ from the dead, ushering in the new creation beginning with Jesus' body. So Jesus' person, his life, and ministry are shaped by the equipping power of the Holy Spirit, an equipping that results in Jesus bringing about the new creation. And no matter how great an earthly ruler is, nobody has a spirit-saturated life and ministry from heaven other than Jesus. Nobody can bring forth life from the dead and brand new realities and possibilities for the people of God. And yet Jesus can and has and continues to do so. So he will be a spirit-saturated king. The second thing is he will be a king who administers righteous judgment. You can see that in verses 3 through 5. It says in verse 3, He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. In the ancient world, one of the primary roles of kings was to judge. And a nation's morality and its vitality very much depended on the king passing righteous judgments. For example, imagine a king who has grown up being pampered in the royal court all his life, and the main bane of his existence from youth to adulthood before he ascends to the throne has been walking out outside the royal gates and beggars, those who are poor, asking him for some money or something that he can do for them. And so finally, he ascends to the throne And somebody comes before him, a poor man who has been oppressed by one that is more powerful than he. And the poor man asks him, judge on my behalf and vindicate me in your righteous judgment. And the king says, you're the eyesore of this kingdom. I will by no means vindicate you. It is only a matter of time before that judgment of the king then becomes the morality of the nation that he is living in. 20 years from that point, There will be no treating of the poor as though they were even human. When somebody looks on a poor person, they will think, well, the king will certainly not judge me for treating or taking advantage of this poor person. And so in the ancient world, the judgments of the king became the morality of the society that he was head over. And in the Bible, there is a famous story of King Solomon. Soon after becoming a king, he passes a righteous judgment. And this is given right after being uh, his ascent to the throne, showing that he is the ideal king. And it is a judgment between two mothers who both claim that the child that is in their possession is their own. And it's a sticky situation, and yet Solomon, in his wisdom and in his discernment and his knowledge of good and evil, is able to get to the heart of the matter and restore the child to its rightful owner. And then the text says, after that occurs, that word of Solomon's just judgment went throughout all the land. Now, the Israelite would know that a wise, discerning, and righteous king was sitting on the throne. 
This would inspire terror and evildoers who would eventually come before him, but it would also encourage those who were innocent to plead their case before him. And the reason in our text in verse 4 that the meek and the poor are specifically mentioned is because they are often those who do not have the appearance of righteousness. Appearances are always with the rich and those already in positions of power. And this is true even in our own day. And it is amazing if somebody is wealthy, how they can turn a case that is against them in which they are the clear criminal into a case that it makes it look like someone else is a criminal and they were actually doing the right thing, whether it's by bribing professional witnesses to come in and witness in the courtroom. By and large, it is the poor and the meek in this earth that end up not receiving their righteous reward. And oftentimes, they receive the punishment that the rich escape by bribery or favoritism, laziness or lack of understanding on the part of the judge. So this text eagerly awaits the coming of the Lord Jesus, the same Jesus who says when he comes, behold, one greater than Solomon is among you, somebody who can pass righteous judgment, not according to appearances or what is said, but seek not just to the heart of the issue, but the heart of all mankind. John says that the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. And in Acts, it's recorded, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This man is Christ Jesus, the King of the nations. Jesus is the perfect judge, judging not by appearances, but seeing down to the heart of an issue and the heart of man itself. And there are various examples of this in Jesus' own ministry, but one in particular strikes me. Do you remember when the poor widow comes and gives a couple copper coins into the uh, temple treasury? And it is against the backdrop of rich young rulers coming in and granting much to the temple. And Jesus sees that, and as king, makes a judgment. And he says, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more than all of them combined. Jesus sees not according to appearance. This widow only had two copper coins. But he sees down into the heart of the matter, and he accurately assesses and judges that this poor widow has given more than all the rich rulers in the temple at the time. He is a perfect judge who meets out perfect justice, particularly to the poor and to those who do normally not receive it through the kingdoms of this earth. Finally, the third thing is peace, and you can see that in verses 6 through 9. Verses 6 through 9. In verse 6, it pitch, uh, pictures antithetical enemies in the animal kingdom who there is no way that they could ever lie down together. And yet, the text says that they will have a mutual dwelling place together. Verse 7 says there's going to be a domesticating of even the most feared creatures. Look at 7b, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Could you imagine that picture of a lion who jumps on a gazelle or anything that is in its sight, and yet he's chewing straw like an ox? Something that has been so fierce and violent and terrifying has now become domesticated. And in verse 8, it says there's going to be a safety even in the most dangerous of situations. So you have every mother's nightmare, a child playing over a cobra's den, playing with an adder, and yet it is not dangerous for him. Rather, there is peace in all of God's holy mountain. And it is because the verse is given in nine, or the reason is given in verse 9b. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This peace that comes will occur because this king so accurately reflects the one true God in his dominion. So accurately does he reflect this one true God that the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Colossians 1.15 says, Jesus is the image 
of the invisible God and in his reign and rule, which is primarily composed of suffering service, we get a perfect picture of how God reigns in this world in contrast to earthly rulers who do just the opposite. And so against the backdrop of two failing kings, we have this prophecy to God's people that one day a king will come who will rule over them and he will bring a new creation by the Spirit and perfect peace and righteous judgment for all. So what should our response be? What are we called living under Christ's reign and rule now? First, when this king finally came 700 years or so after Isaiah's prophecy, he came with a particular message. And that message was this, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance is very simple. It means to change your mind. Perhaps all your life and up to this point, you have been trusting in man to bring about peace, salvation, prosperity, and righteousness on earth. You've looked to man for your own vindication and for an acquittal in the wrongs that have been done to you. And when political rulers or authorities in your life have failed you, you've taken it into your own hand, trusting yourself to bring about what you desire. And so Jesus' message as he comes into the world and establishes God's kingdom on earth, is repent. Change your mind. It is God's appointment of Jesus Christ as king of the earth, and it is God's giving of all authority on heaven and earth to him that will bring peace and prosperity. He and he alone is the one who brings the new creation with righteous judgment and perfect peace for all. And perhaps this practically looks like stopping to pay a political party and rather to start praying that Christ's heavenly policies would be manifested on earth and in your own life as well. Second, verse 10 in our text promises that the nations will inquire of him in the day that this righteous ruler comes. And the word for inquire here means to consult, and it has a connotation of uh, frequency. Sometimes it's used of a person frequenting a place that they enjoy going to. It pictures kings, families, children, and every creature under the sun frequently going to this righteous ruler, to this king, and asking or consulting how they are to run their nation, how they are to run their family, how they are to govern their lives. And again, perhaps you have been consulting everyone and anyone on how to live your life, how to do your work, how to run your family, whatever it is. You've been consulting anyone you can find except the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is true even in our nation. Our universities and political institutions pay billions of dollars each year to bring in international consultants and experts on foreign policy, economic growth, whatever it is. And yet this text says that we have a heavenly expert the Lord of life himself. And in his day, the nations will inquire of him, asking him how they can come under his glorious reign and rule, and then be an agent of extending that reign and rule to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus Christ is the ideal king. And if you believe on him, you are under his reign and rule, that which is in heaven but that is increasingly coming to earth and will one day fully come when he returns to judge the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that uh, even in our own country, amidst perhaps the dark backdrop of uh, political candidates that are running for various positions of leadership and authority in our nation, we are already under the reign and rule of Jesus Christ. And we pray for those who are not who have not experienced your spirit coming into them and transferring them out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your son, that you would work powerfully in their hearts, that you would continue to bring more under the banner of Jesus Christ, that perfect peace, righteous judgment, and nothing short of a new creation would occur on this earth. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.